Well, I hope you already have this passage opened in your Bible in Matthew chapter 25. Brother Jason had read that uh, for us mom moments ago. And uh, that's where the message is going to be coming from today. So leave your Bible open to that passage. But if you would, would you take a moment to join me in prayer this morning and ask God to uh, bless our time. Lord, we thank you for this day you have given to us. We thank you for the opportunity. Lord, we thank you not only that uh, we have a place to come, but Lord, we know uh, beyond a shadow of a doubt that you will meet with us because you have promised us that. And so God, I am just asking today that you would uh, meet with us, that you would forgive me of the sin that is in my life, that you would place it beneath the blood of Jesus. Lord, that you would help us today as we study from your word. Lord, that you would use this message to challenge us and to uh, encourage us. And I pray that we would be better as a result of hearing this message and studying this message today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, leave your Bible open to Matthew chapter 25. This is a very familiar parable uh, that Jesus taught. It's known as the parable of the talents. And as we look at this parable, I want to begin by just asking a question today that I hope you'll give some serious thought to. And here's the question. How many of you would consider yourself, and you don't have to raise your hand, this is just for you to answer to yourself. How many of you would consider yourself a good investor? You think about your life and you think, yeah, that's one part of my life that I have figured out. I am a good investor. Now, wait a minute. Let me throw a wrench in the plans here. I'm not so much talking about financially. You may have invested good financially, but I'm talking about investing your life. When you look at your life as a Christian, can you honestly say that I have invested well? I read a story this week about one of our former presidents, and it was some 40, maybe even 50 years ago, I guess it was, probably 40-something years ago. He made this statement. He said, there are one or two things I do not have yet, a television network and the U.S. presidency. And this particular man had gazed up at his $200 million Trump Tower, and he thought to himself, I will be 38 years old next month, and I've done everything that I have wanted to do. And then he said, sometimes I think it was a mistake to have raced through it all so fast, and he asked this question, he said, what's the next level up? He said, I don't believe in reincarnation, I don't believe in heaven, I don't believe in hell. But we do go someplace, I know. And he asked the question, do you know where we go? And he said in that closing document, I cannot for the life of me figure out where that is. Now that was a picture of a former president that we had that early on in his life he was a man that was so busy possessing the world that at that time he had made no preparations for the next. That describes many people in our world today, that we are so focused on now and preparing for now that we don't spend the time to think about what's coming next. And by the way, before we would point our finger at an individual like that, many of us are capable of doing the very same thing. Many of us may be asking that same question, what is life all about? Even as a Christian sometimes, we can become very confused and sidetracked and the question really becomes, what is life all about? Well, it has been suggested one time that there's three things we can do with life. We can waste it, we can spend it, or we can invest it. Have you ever heard that before? Wasting life is no stranger to any of us because we know how easy it is to waste our life. Spending our life is also something that is very easy for us to do. We can spend our lives on a career. We can spend our lives on a hobby. We can spend our lives acquiring certain things and pursuing certain things. But investing our life as a Christian is much more difficult. And there's kind of a lot to that when we think about that. And so Jesus uses this passage, this parable, to teach us about what it means as a believer to invest our lives. In fact, he gives seven principles in this passage. Now, I'm going to do something that I don't think I've ever done before. I'm going to preach the message this morning. 
about these seven principles, just kind of a guideline, a, a 30,000 foot view of what Jesus is saying here. And then tonight in our Bible study, what we're going to do is dig into more depth into what Jesus is saying. And so if you have an outline this morning and you come to Bible study, be sure to bring this back with you because that is your outline and that's what we're going to do, uh, look at tonight, some uh, principles that Jesus gives for investing our life. And so really today's sermon is an introduction to the Bible study that I'm going to have this evening. Well, what are these principles that Jesus lays out in this parable? Again, what is the question? The question is, how do I, as a child of God, invest my life? James said it this way. He said, life is a vapor. It's here for a very short time, and then it vanishes away, just like a vapor. That's how James describes our life. Can you agree with me today that the clock is ticking? Now, none of us are in a hurry to die, but regardless of our age, that clock of life is ticking. And James was right when he said it's a vapor. Life goes by so quick, it's just a short time, and then poof, it's gone just like that. And so with that thought in mind, what do we need to know about investing our life? Well, here's the first thing I want you to write down and I want you to keep in mind. It all has to do with ownership. We must know who it is that owns the details of our life. And when I say ownership, just remember this thought. Everything I have belongs to God. Now, have we not made the mistake of saying, my home, my car, my family, my church? We, we portray in the Christian life that all of these things are, are ours. But in reality, we need to think about true ownership. And Jesus teaches that principle in this passage. God made it all. He even made you. He made me. And so God owns everything. One day, you and I will take our last breath in this world. And I know that you already know this, but it's worth telling you again. You will not take one single thing with you when you go. Even the clothes they put on your body will deteriorate with your body because God owns it all. You do not come into this world with anything and you do not leave this world with anything. It all belongs to God. God just allows us to use it. Now with that thought in mind, it would behoove us today to remember this issue of ownership. In fact, go back to verse 14 of our text in Matthew chapter 25 and And as we start to look at this, I want you to notice a couple things here. Here's what Jesus said. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto him his goods. Now the question that is drawn out there is, whose property was it? Was it the servants or was it the master's? And the point Jesus is teaching us is it belonged to the master. He's teaching us a principle of ownership. God has entrusted in us time. God has entrusted in us things. But at the end of the day, it all belongs to God. Now, if you can get this one principle down, you'll be coming a long way. And that principle is ownership. God owns everything. Are we on the same page so far? We believe that God owns it all. Now here's a second principle that Jesus teaches us in this passage. And that is the principle of allocation. And what do we mean by allocation? Well, that means, as Jesus taught us here, God has given us, as believers, some talents. You have a talent. You may not think of yourself as a talented person, but I can assure you God has given you some talents. Go to verse 15 of our text. And unto one he gave five talents, and to another two, and to another one, and every man according to his ability. Underline that because that is extremely important in that passage. To every man according to his ability. Now here's what we have to understand. Back in this day, a talent simply meant a sum of money. 
But you can use that uh, as a metaphor of a talent is anything that God has entrusted you with. If you have children, that is a talent. If you have a job, that's a talent that God has given you. If you have hobbies and you have things, it's things that God has given you, those are talents. But let's look a little more in depth in this passage. In fact, let's make this a little bit easier to understand. Here is Jesus saying that the master goes out and he's got three guys there. And he gives the one guy $5,000. Let's just use that just for simple math purposes. One guy gets $5,000. Another guy gets $2,000. And then there's another guy that gets $1,000. So man A, $5,000. Man B, $2,000. Man C, $1,000. And God says, Jesus says in this passage, I want you to take what I have given you and I want you to invest that. Now, that is a picture of our life. Whatever God has given us, it's all different. We are not all on the same level here today. Not only economically and socially, but just educationally. All of us are at different levels here today. But that doesn't mean that God has left any of us out. And so, He gives them different amounts, but He gives all of them something. And the point of that that Jesus is making is there is no such thing as a no-talent person. There's not one person that's sitting here today that would be able to say, I have no talents, I have nothing that I can use for God. I have nothing to give for God. And again, we're not necessarily talking about money. We're talking about the talents God has given you. In fact, when you think about spiritual gifts, the Bible teaches us that uh, God has given every believer at least one spiritual gift. In Romans chapter 12 and verse 6, it says, Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given therein to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. The point is, God gives everybody a spiritual gift that is a believer. And the same is true when we think about these talents. There is no one else in the world exactly like you. Have you ever thought about that? And God has chosen you specifically to use something in a way that no one else would be able to use it in that way. And so Jesus is teaching them, yes, about ownership. It all belongs to God. But he's also teaching them about allocation. That is, God gives you these talents. Now there's a third principle that Jesus teaches in this passage, and that is accountability. Accountability. What is the point that Jesus is making here? Well, God expects you to use those talents. If he's given it to you, and you know it all belongs to God anyways, and he's blessed you with that talent, God expects you to use it for him. Look at verse 19 of our text. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. You ever heard of the day of reckoning? The time comes whenever uh, the Lord says, okay, I have given you these talents. What did you do with them? What type of investment have you made? And God is saying, I want to see what my return is. Do you know that the Bible speaks about two judgments? The Bible speaks about the great white throne judgment. That's where every man that is lost will come before God and will kneel down before God and confess God as Savior and Lord. But then there's something called the judgment seat of Christ. And that's the day when we will stand before Christ and he will say, these are the talents that I have given you. What have you done with these things? Now I want to ask you a question today. Are you ready for that? See, a lot of people have this idea, idea at the judgment seat of Christ uh, that we're going to stand there and, and we're going to just be trembling and in tear and in fear for our life. But it's going to be more of a thing of shame for many when Jesus says I gave you all these opportunities and what did you do with these opportunities what did you do with the talents that I gave you did you waste it did you spend it did you invest it well it brings us to the fourth principle that Jesus makes in this passage of the talents and that is utilization 
Now, what is Jesus teaching us by utilization? Well, he's teaching us that it's wrong to bury or to put away what God has given you and do nothing with it. That's not the reason God gives us these talents. In fact, it tells us in our passage that the first man took his money, and what did he do? He doubled it. The second guy took his $2,000, and he doubled it. But the point of this parable is the third guy. And that's what Jesus wants us to focus in on. And so look at verse 18 of our text, because this is the focus of this entire passage. But he that hath received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. Now, there's a great picture here of God giving us a talent. And us saying, well, you know what? I don't want to use it. I just want to keep it for a rainy day. And so he does nothing. He just wanted to play it safe. He sat on it. That, my friend, describes the life of many Christians. They say they want to live for God, but they don't do anything. They don't use the talents God has given them, and so they just sit on it. And they say, I'm a Christian, I'm safe, I'm going to heaven, and that's all I'm worried about. But what was the reaction of the master? Well, Jesus tells us in verse 26, and I want you to get this. Jesus said, His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knowest that I reap where I sowed not, and I gather where I have not sowed. Why was the master so upset? Because the master expected that the least he could have done was invested it in some way. And do you not think God would not be upset with us as Christians looking at us and doing absolutely nothing, just playing it safe? Life is about faith, is it not? If there's one thing the New Testament teaches us, it's about faith. In fact, in Romans chapter 14 and verse 23, Paul said, For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. We as Christians are to live our life in faith. In Hebrews 11:6, 6, Paul said, Without faith it's impossible to please him. Playing it safe in life is not about having faith. And I'm not talking about being careless. I'm talking about in the way that we live our Christian lives, we have to live a life full of faith. Now there's another principle here, a fifth principle that Jesus gives in this passage that I don't want us to overlook, and that is motivation. Principle number five, motivation. So what is Jesus teaching here? Well, he's teaching that fear keeps me from developing my talent. See, it's not that God has not given us a talent, it's that many of us have not developed the talents that God has given us. And church, I want to tell you something. Fear is always Satan's favorite tactic. Did you hear that? Fear is always Satan's favorite tactic. Why? Because Satan will always use fear to cause self-doubt. He will use fear to cause self-pity. And he will use fear to cause self-consciousness or low self-esteem. Anytime you as a Christian are sitting on your talents, usually it's because of one of those things. That is, I, I have self-doubt. And Satan begins to make you think and cause you to think, I can't do that. I can't be that kind of Christian. Yes, all these other Christians are good and they do great things, but I could never do that. Why? Because I'm not qualified. Do you know how many times in ministry I've ask people, have you ever thought about doing this or that? And the reaction is almost always the same. Oh, pastor, I don't think I'm qualified to do that. And my response is always the same. Absolutely, that's why I'm asking you to do it. Because I want to see God use this talent that I've recognized in you and others have recognized in you, and we want to see God grow that talent. By the way, just mark this down in verse 25. You can write self-doubt Next to verse 25, we see it there. He said, I was afraid and went and hid the talent in the earth. He doubted what he could do with it. What about self-pity? Self-pity says, but I failed so many times as a Christian, I don't want to fail again. What about self-consciousness? Being self-conscious is, well, what will other people think about me? Well, look at verse 24. 
Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art an hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strawed. You see, fear causes me to think of excuses. Fear causes me to do nothing. And so as a result, Christianity is full of a bunch of do-nothing Christians. And that's not me being unkind. That's the reality of the world that we live in. Christians that do absolutely nothing. They have talents and they're not using their talents. Principle number six Jesus gives us is the application of it all. Now what did he mean by application? Well, if you do not use your talent, guess what's going to happen? God will take it away. You say, would he really do that? Absolutely. If you say, God, I know you have gifted me, you have given me this talent, but I refuse to use it, God will say, okay, then I'm going to take it away from you and I'm going to give it to someone else. Look at verse 28. Take therefore the talent from him and give it unto him which hath ten talents. You say, that's not fair, but the guy with ten talents is using his talents. And that's why Jesus said that if we don't use this in the proper application, God will take these talents from us. Now there's one final principle that Jesus gives. And I'm going to talk more about this tonight, but the seventh principle is compensation. That means if I use what God has given me, I am guaranteed that God is going to reward me. Now, I like rewards, don't we all? Everybody likes to be recognized. We like rewards. And the point is, there is compensation when it comes to these talents. Look at verse 23. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Now, some of these parables, I realize, it's, it's hard to stay focused, and it's hard to, uh, to really be able to tell kind of what's going on in these parables. And that's the, the other reason I want to discuss it more um, tonight. But here's the point that I really want you to get with this parable. One day, God is going to take an audit of your life. And that audit is going to show a prophet or a loss in the terms of these talents. Now we're not talking about money. We're talking about things God has given you and how you have managed those things. I would not be your friend. I would not be a good pastor. I would not be a good spiritual leader if I did not warn you and tell you and correct you and say the time to prepare is now. You don't want to stand before the Lord at the judgment seat of Christ, and hear him say, okay, this is what I've given you in your life. Now what have you done with it? And say, nothing. Not that he's going to send you to hell. That's not the point of that. But to be able to stand there empty-handed. Listen, we have a guide in our life right now. That guide is the Holy Spirit. Jesus gave us this parable to remind us that life is so short. It's going to go by so fast. And it's easy for us to say, well, I've wasted most of my life now. Why not? Why worry about it now? And the reality is, regardless of where you're at in life, there's still time to change that around. If God has given you a talent, you make a commitment to say, God, I want to know what it is. And truthfully, you probably already know the abilities and the talents that God has given you. And God has given us many different ways that we can serve Him. You know, one of the most, uh, probably the easiest way, I think, um, when it comes to service is just to be faithful. I mean, how, how much effort does that take just to be faithful? Most of the time, whenever I talk to people and the nursing home or former members and things like that when they no longer can come to church or they're homebound or something like that. You know what they always say? Without doubt, I sure miss coming to church. I sure miss being with God's people. 
You know how often, like today, when I woke up, I felt that way? Believe me, if I wasn't the pastor, I probably wouldn't have been here today. I'm just going to be honest with you. It was one of those days where it would have been nice just to sleep in. Not a good spiritual example for you, I realize. But nonetheless, we all feel that way at times. But God's given us the ability, the health, the means to be here. Isn't it one of the simplest things we can do just to be faithful in our service? And it's not just that. There's many areas that God has given us. There's many things that we can do. God doesn't want us to come and sit and soak and sour, as preachers have said, for years and years and years. God wants us to serve. And if there's one thing that this parable teaches us, it's that God one day will look at our service record and what will he say to us then? So here's my challenge to you today, church. Examine your life. Understand it's a vapor. Understand it's very short in the realm of eternity. And ask yourself, am I using the God-given gifts and ability that he has given me for his glory and for his kingdom? And if not, you make a decision. One, I don't care if God has given me that. I'm not going to use it. Or two, you say, God, I know that you have given me that. And to the day that I can no longer do it, I'm going to use that talent for you. Are you willing to think about that and do that this morning? I sure hope and pray that you will. Let's stand together if we could. Lord, we thank you today for giving us this opportunity again to be able to stand and to be able to proclaim your word. Lord, I want to thank you for your teaching, your teachings that are so clear to us. And God, I can only speak for myself, but there's so many areas that I fail you in the area of service. And so, Lord, today I need to repent of that, and I do. God, I pray that you would just strengthen us, that you would help us to look at our life, to take an evaluation of our life. Lord, to not take it for granted. We know the world around us, it seems, has gone mad and has gone crazy, but that doesn't neglate the fact that, Lord, we still have work to do. And so help us as your children, as your servants, to do exactly that. Help us to take the opportunity in the moment today to do an evaluation of our own life and say, God, am I serving you to the very best of my ability? And Lord, help us to take that seriously and help us to make the changes we need to make today. We pray this in Jesus' name.